Come on, if you have a reason to praise tonight, I want to get you out of your seats. Come on. Who's been bought by the blood? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath come on. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. the valley I praise on the mountain I praise when I'm sure I praise when I'm doubting I praise when I'm number I praise when surrounding cause praise is the water I'll praise when I don't, cause you're worthy, Father. I'll praise cause I know you're still in control. My praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, I still got to pray oh my soul praise the Lord oh my soul I won't no I won't be quiet my God is alive how could I keep inside I won't be quiet I won't be quiet my God is
I praise when I don't. I praise cause I know you're still in control. Cause my praise is a weapon. It's born in a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. Everyone shout! Oh. And everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord.
There's no 
to do in our lives come on come on family come on that God he can do whatever 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 he wants to do and he can shake some things some tradition some religion say well I don't have any religion or tradition liar Stop it. We'll just have an altar call right now. Every one of us, come on, every one of us can get stuck in our own way. And let this year be the year that we get out of the way. 
Come on, then we get out of the way and let Holy Spirit, come on, do what He wants to do. It's a dangerous prayer. If you re- how, many, how many out there really mean that? This year, 2024, you're going to make this your theme, your anthem, your prayer. God, this year, do whatever you need to do in my life. And I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to get out of the way and make room for you. (laughs) I believe it. You wouldn't be here (laughs) if it wasn't for this prayer and the cry of your heart. It's a miracle that our guest speaker here tonight, Matt, is here. It's a miracle that Troy uh, and and Jennifer are here. It's a miracle that Toby and Patty are here. They just got over the past before the past closed. I mean, it's just... So I believe you're here because you're supposed to be here. And I believe that this year is going to be a special year, a special year in your life. It's going to be a holy year. It's going to be a glorious year. And we're going to kick it off right with this conference. And we're going to make room for God to just do whatever he wants to do. Can we, uh, is that all right, Sherilyn, if we do this song just a moment? Come on, everybody stand. Everybody stand. Come on, let's shake off anything that's been hanging on to us from last year, from 2023. Come on, let's shake it off. Anything that's in our way, come on. Sometimes it's ourselves we get in our own way. Come on, I don't want to get in my own way this year. I want Holy Spirit to have His way. Come on. How many want Holy Spirit right now in this place? Right now, the wind of the Holy Spirit blowing in this place. Right now, the grace of God touching your heart. Right now, the wind of the Holy Spirit moving in this place right now. Come on. Come on. Shake up the ground to all my tradition. Break down the walls. whatever you want to do. Come on, whatever you want to do, Jesus, do it! Do it! Come on, shout, do it! Do it, Lord! Woo! Jesus, your way is the best. The best. Lord, we make room.
Yeah. Yeah. Just song of the Lord. Go ahead. With our hands lifted high in praise. Yeah. And it's you. see the hand of the Lord. He's going to stretch forth his hand and do beautiful things. Amen. Can we thank the worship team? Come on, let's thank the worship team. Yeah. Come on, Pastor Sherilyn from Access Church. Come on, give it up for Pastor Sherilyn. Jeff and Amy, Sozo Church, Pastor Tom. Come on. Woo! Amen. Amen. And the Jake's House team. Come on. Woo! Yeah. Well, hey, um, if you're new to us here tonight or to the conference, uh, I just want to warn you right up front, we're wild, crazy. Uh, we're, we're huggers. So if, if you're afraid of getting hugged, I don't know what to tell you. Get delivered in Jesus' name. But, uh, <laughs> but we, uh, we want to take a couple minutes right now and just move around. Uh, meet some people, hug some people, say hi, greet, greet everyone here to the conference, and uh, come on, go, don't be shy, move around, say hi to some people, love some people, come on, introduce yourself, come on, spread the love.
All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. How many love Refresh Conference? Woo! <laughs> so uh, we took a couple extra minutes in our transition right now because I went running upstairs to uh, yell and scream at my son-in-law and the Bethel team. So they'll be down here in a little bit. They're eating right now. But uh, my son-in-law, his car, um, they actually, because you know the freezing rain out there, they actually slid off the road. So, it's, but they're okay. Everything's fine. And, uh, but praise God. We're all safe. And we're starting this thing off. Come on with, with the glory of God. How many, how many are hungry for God to just do something awesome? Amen. Hey, um, none of this would happen if it wasn't for just great friendships, partnerships, and relationships. And uh, these last couple of years, uh, there have been some friends that have just stood with Carmen and myself, this church, supported us just so in such a special, powerful way. And at this time, I just want to honor our board members. So Troy and Jennifer Shadid, Jennifer, uh, Generations Church, uh, California, and Co go ahead and stand up. Sorry, I'm getting all choked up here. And then Jeff and Holly Hastings, Reset Church. Come on, come on, let's welcome our board members. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh man, praise the Lord. But uh, we love our board members. Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. And uh, they're such a, such a blessing. Also, uh, we've got many guests that will be here throughout the week. And so we, we just want to honor them and, and welcome them, love them. Uh, coming in from uh, many places from California, Idaho, all around. So Vegas. Oregon, Vegas. Yeah, yeah. And so Pastor Denise, Vegas. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Angela. Well, at this time, um, we're going to receive the offering. And so, come on, let's welcome Troy Shadid to the pulpit. Come on, one more time. How y'all doing? That didn't sound very Californian, did it? So, uh, thanks uh, for being here tonight and uh, making it through the weather. And... Uh, I was raised in Nebraska, so it was no problem for me driving in the snow, and uh, my wife was a bit nervous. She was born and raised, lived her whole life in California, so uh, she was a little, little shaky, but uh, we made it here. You know, we kept it under 80, so it was fine, so just teasing. Um, Pastor uh, Keith and Carmen, thank you so much for, uh, you know, letting me uh, uh, be up here and honored to always stand in someone else's pulpit, but... Uh, my wife and I, we pastor uh, a church that has uh, different locations uh, in Southern California, Mexico, and the country of Myanmar on the other side of the world. And so we're uh, excited about what God's doing through our ministry. And uh, I spoke here a few years ago. I don't know if you, any of you remember. My, my, honking and flapping. That's right. That's exactly what I talked on. Honking and flapping. I am honored that you even remembered any of that. So, uh, honking and flapping. So, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a good time. But tonight I have the honor to do generosity time. So, uh, this is when most uh, Christians and churches get really quiet and they start digging around in their purse and looking on their phone for things to try to get irritated, agitated because it's offering time. So, 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, I'm a pastor, and when I'm doing this at my church, I have to be careful what I say. But this is not my church. <laughs> so <laughs> I got the shotguns out tonight, and uh, we're going to take some fire, all right? We're just going to let it rip. And, uh, you know, it's always amazing to me. Uh, I only got five minutes. I'm sorry. I'm going to take some of Pastor Matt's time. Uh, it's always amazing to me how Christians argue with God when it comes to finances. Like we want to say that we know better. He simply told us in the Word what to do, but yet we'll argue because we just don't believe it. And suddenly we have become idolatry. We have placed ourselves above God and God's Word because we know better when it comes to finances. Therefore, you have to handle all your finances and you can't ask God to give you any finances because you've ruled Him out. But that's not what I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about 2 Kings chapter 4. That's just a little pet peeve of mine that just irritates me. So, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. All right, you guys ready? Verse 1. Now, oh, I'm supposed to tell you. Um, 
up on the screen a minute ago was all the ways you could give. So uh, how, how many have never been to this church before? Raise your hand. You've never been here before. Thanks, Pastor Brett. You're the guest speaker. Uh, anybody else? You've never been here before? Okay. So that means all of you know how to give? You know all the ways to give? This should be the biggest offering ever. Okay. Because everybody knows how. All right. I want to show you something in the Word tonight. Are you guys ready? Say, blow my mind. I'm going to try. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says, And a certain woman, I think it's interesting. She didn't even have a name. She's just a certain woman. But it's one of the most profound scriptures that we hear talked about all the time. But a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor, come on, say Visa and MasterCard, is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Look at your neighbor and say, what do you have in the house? Look at your second choice and say, what do you have in the house? He didn't even look at his first choice or second choice. He's still looking at his phone over there. Everybody look at him, the guy I'm pointing at right now. Yeah, you right there. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I've always wanted to do that. Thank you for obliging. I'll give you the 20 bucks later. All right. What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? How many know what's always already in the house? And we call this the house. It's already in the house, right? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. We will always devalue what we have thinking it's not good enough. When it could be a miracle just waiting to happen. You may think your gifting is not good enough, but it's a miracle about ready to happen for somebody else. Don't devalue what you got. Oh, I got the jar of oil. God doesn't like me. I don't have one of them special singing voices like all those people that get to be on stage. It's probably why God didn't give you one because you're looking at the stage. A good voice. So... I'm sorry, this is just my gift. I told you I was bringing shotguns, okay? Then he said, here we go, are you ready? Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you, and your sons they pour, uh, then pour it out, uh, pour into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. When the giving ceases, the oil ceases. When the giving ceases, the oil ceases. The anointing oil. The tangible presence of God oil. We never want the oil to dry, but we always come to these services. Come on, God, pour out your oil. But when it comes to offering time, (laughs) but we want the oil, but we don't want what it takes to bring the anointing. So the oil ceased. Then uh, she came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt, and your son shall live in the rest. Now, here's something that I just want to introduce to you tonight that I've never really probably had a whole lot of people think about. The people not mentioned in this text are the people with the vessels. He gave her instructions, and the sons said, go get vessels from all the houses, knock on doors, ask your neighbors. The miracle was in the generosity of the neighbors. The miracle was in the generosity of the Of who is behind the door. He said we're going to do a miracle. Oil's going to come. But you got to go get vessels. And until people were generous. To give a vessel from their own house. To the house. The oil would cease. Don't be the one. That stops the oil. But not releasing. The jar. For the miracle of God to happen. So tonight. When we give our offering. Let's not be the one to stop up the oil. Let's be the one that goes, how many jars you need? How many jars do you need? Amen? 
So now the things how you give here are up on the screen, and I pray, pray that you are blessed uh, when you give tonight. You know, when we, give our, bring our, when we bring our tithes and our offerings, you know, we're really just returning to God what is already His, right? So some people, well, it's just not on my heart. God didn't ask you if it was on your heart. He commanded you to bring your tithes into the house. The offering is out of your heart of generosity. So tonight, it's simply out of your heart of generosity. This isn't bringing your tithes. This is an offering for the conference, for the guest speakers, and for everything that's going to happen. And we don't want the oil to cease. So I pray that you give generously. Amen. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for tonight. We thank you, Father God, that the oil flows and flows to overflowing. We thank you, Father God, that every vessel in this place is filled with the oil. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name that we don't just come and want to receive, but we come and give, uh, Father God, generously tonight. We thank you for every need abundantly above all we could ask, think, or imagine will be accomplished because of your word and because of the generosity of your people, that every speaker would be blessed, Father God, every ministry would be blessed, and Father God, that there wouldn't be a time where we ask for another vessel and there's not any. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If the ushers come and pass the bowls. Come on, right? pass Something those. Like that. Thank you so much. Well, that was good. Don't let the oil stop flowing. Wow. Come on now. Well, tonight we have such a treat, and I just want to say hello to everybody online. We're so glad that you joined us online tonight. The roads were pretty great. Matt Lockett is the executive director of Justice House of Prayer, D.C. Come on. Located on Capitol Hill. From the governmental gate of the nation, Matt leads prayer and intercession that appeals to a holy hill higher than Capitol Hill. Say amen. To a heavenly court above the Supreme Court. Say amen. Matt has served as full-time missionary in the nation's capital since 2005. Matt teaches on the topics of prayer, fasting, and governmental intercession. His passion, say his passion. His passion is to help father young consecrated generation that will usher justice into the earth. Matt, Matt also directs Bound for Life, a pro-life prayer movement universally recognized by the iconic red tape worn over the mouth with the word life, hallelujah. It is not a protest. It is a prayer meeting. Hallelujah. Matt is the father of four children. Hallelujah. He has, I think you said three grandchildren, a little more than that's on here. And he is married. His wife's name is Kim, and they live in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I, I, I saw Matt, actually, at a National Day of Prayer event. He is on the board of the National Day of Prayer. And when he began to speak, uh, he didn't just carry the authority of a, a believer. He carried the authority of a receiver. And my heart started to burn, and I knew he was a man of prayer. And I was like, this guy has to come to Jake's House Church. I was like, he has to come to Jake's House Church. And so uh, last night we were talking, I think it was yesterday sometime, and uh, he said, I am an intercessor. It's like the highest thing possible. We have a high priest that prays for us, and so to stand and intercede. Can you please stand up tonight, and can we welcome, hallelujah, Matt Lockett. It will be unblocked tonight in Jesus' name. Toby, come on up. Hallelujah. Jake's House Church and, and friends, reach out your hands tonight. I'm going to get Pastor Toby to pray for this guy as he brings the word. Hallelujah. Jesus, I pray the Holy Ghost would move through this man and every word in his heart would come forth from you. Anoint him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, what an honor it is to be here with you all. And as Angela shared, uh, I'm enjoying just getting to know her uh, just in the past few months. Uh, I've been a part of uh, what's known as the National Prayer Committee for about seven or eight years, just serving uh, 
uh, in a supportive role in that way. And then there was a some changes that were made this year and I was given the privilege and the honor of being able to serve on the board of directors. And so we, we gathered, um, all of the state coordinators gathered in Kentucky. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but there's a Noah's Ark in Kentucky. <laughs> Full size, life size, you know, it, it, I wasn't sure what to expect and uh, showed up and sure enough, it's actual size, pretty extraordinary, uh, to see that, but all of the state coordinators for National Day of Prayer gathered there for their annual uh, meeting, and uh, uh, I was just there to encourage. And so I, I think I, uh, Kathy Branzell, is the president of National Day of Prayer, asked me, can you, can you just take a five minutes just to encourage the leaders? And that's how Angela and I got connected, so oh, wow. now I'm here. <laughs> how many of you have uh, ever gone to D.C.? Washington, D.C. Okay. Quite a few of you. Now, wait a minute. So keep those hands up. How many of you went there to pray? Okay. Wow. So look around. I'm actually amazed. Usually I don't see, out of a group this size, I don't see that many hands. So I already know that there's something unique in this house. Uh, most people have abdicated all of that stuff. And, and, uh, and so it blesses me to see that that many of you have, have gone there to pray I encourage everybody, please, please, come to Washington, D.C. and come to pray. You should come. All the demons do. Yeah. <laughs> Does anybody doubt me? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, come and, and pray. I have had uh, <clears throat> an amazing experience in Washington, D.C., and I've had the privilege of being a missionary on Capitol Hill for about 19 years, and um, what I would like to do is make a, a, a statement tonight before I get started with what I feel like the Lord's given me to share with you, and, and uh, I want to say this, that I, I to the, by the grace of God, to the best of my ability, I will not speak to you tonight about theories. I don't want to come and present ideas of how I think things might kind of sort of work. I would like to come tonight with testimonies Hallelujah. of answered prayer and, and come to you with a perspective of how I believe God is raising up the body of Christ to contend with governing authority in the earth. And I'm going to come at this at a little bit of a different angle, uh, if that's okay. Um, yes. You know, you've all probably got a handful of scriptures that you're already familiar with that have to do with praying for government. Maybe First Timothy 2, we're supposed to pray for those in authority, pray for the kings, right? You got some of that stuff. I'm actually going to come at it from a little bit of a different angle, if that's okay. And I want to talk tonight about dreams. That's kind of weird, huh? I want to talk to you tonight about prophetic dreams. I don't, I'm not going to talk to you about pizza dreams. Everybody gets pizza dreams, right? Get, get, get late night munchies and you, you eat some late night snacks and then you get weird stuff that kind of bumbles up, bubbles up while you're asleep at night. I'm not talking about pizza dreams. I'm talking about when you go to sleep at night and you, you find that the God of the universe is talking to you and he's speaking your language. I want to talk to you about that. And so... We're going to get into some things tonight, and I, I want to share some stories with you, but first I want to kind of lay some groundwork to give you some expectation. Would you turn in your Bibles with me, or turn on your Bibles, yes. to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, don't worry. It's not the genealogy. <laughs> you, ever, you ever open your Bible and read something only to realize that it was there all along and yet you've never seen it before? This might be one of those things. Matthew chapter 1. I'm just going to start in verse 18 and, and I'm going to read a little bit here. It says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. 
When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a what? In a dream. Saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, I think this is interesting. At this, this pivotal moment in all of human history, in the entire narrative of, 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 our, of, of, of creation, this is the pivotal moment, right? Come, oh, well, I, I would say we're entering into a 33-year pivotal moment, but we're talking about the moment that the uncreated God put on the dust of the earth and he clothed himself in those royal robes. And he enters in in this weak, fragile thing called a baby. This has got to be the most vulnerable point of the story. Think, I mean, we, I've seen some babies here now. I guess my biography says that I have two grandsons. Well, I got a third one about four weeks ago. <laughs> Praise God. So I, I've got three grandsons now. All of them have blue eyes. That's pretty cool. But here you have this, this fragile package, precious cargo. And God is willing to entrust that to a dream and a human being's willingness to obey that dream. Let's keep going with this. Skip down a little bit here. You've got the, the magi, the, the wise men come to, to give homage and uh, to see this great thing. They followed the star. Verse 10, I'm still in Matthew 1. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child and Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a, say it, in a dream, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So, enter, at, at the moment that this fragile package has entered the earth, you have the rise of a dictator. You have the rise of a wicked king that wants to take that thing out. And still, God is supremely confident and willing to entrust the safety of that precious cargo to a dream and humans, the, these, this handful of human beings that are willing to obey the dream. Are you catching this? Let's keep going. Wait, but wait, there's more. Verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a, dream. in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. Again, God gives a dream and a human being obeys the dream. And the precious cargo is saved. Let's keep going. Skip down here to verse 19. I'm, I'm in Matthew 2, by the way. I'm so sorry. It was 2, 2 13. Now, you, you know, you get the idea. <laughs> but when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream, dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. 
And here's the obedience. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream. He, here's the obedience, withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. And so what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. This is one of those things that I'm just stunned by. That you've got this, this fragile package that is the hope of all creation, the hope of the earth. You have a wicked king that wants nothing more than to take this thing out, willing to, to deploy like weapons of mass destruction, like let's make sure we hit the target. So they start killing all the babies, everybody two and under. We're going to make sure we hit the target. But God is supremely confident in this moment. Wow. Wow. This blows my mind. Wow. Like you would think like what kind of artillery, and what kind of machinery would God deploy to protect his own son at the moment that, that, he is, that he is now put on flesh and entered the earth. And God says, I got an idea. Right. Wow. I'm going to give a few people some divine revelation of my thoughts and my will. I'm going to give them dreams and let's see what they do with it. He gives Joseph, maybe there's an experiment here. I don't know, but he gives Joseph a dream and then Joseph obeys the dream. Guess what? Then Joseph gets more dreams. How many dreams from heaven have been deployed to his body with the intention of shifting human history and, and binding wicked kings and protecting the precious cargo of the gospel. And we didn't do anything with them. We said, oh, it's just a dream. Just a dream. Just a dream? Do you know what angels had to fight through to get that thing to you? Is this just an isolated incident? I don't think so. Let's jump over. You don't have to turn. Now. Jump over to the book of Acts. And you've got Acts chapter 16. I just want to pitch this to you here real quick. Acts 16. Paul is carrying the precious cargo of the gospel. And he really wants to go east. He's trying to go east. I want to go east. I'm making a very valiant effort. Now, is it wrong to want to go east and preach the gospel? No. Except it says that every effort he made, he was resisted by the spirit of Jesus. Listen, there, there, there is an element of God's timing that we have to understand. God is the author of a storyline, a meta narrative that is playing out in the earth. And it's no time for the body of Christ to be just shooting in the dark. I don't want to just keep beating my head against the wall. Give us divine revelation so that we can be efficient in what we're doing. You understand what I'm saying? So he wants to go east and Jesus is like, nope. And frustrated, he he ends up, he's in Turkey, Asia Minor there, and he ends up in a little town called Troas, and it says that he went to sleep, and he had a dream. And in the dream, there's a man over in the west, a man in Macedonia, and he's over here looking at him saying, come over here and help us. Well, he has the dream, but then what does the next verse say? It says that he woke up, and he... he he interpreted this mysterious dream. No, it says he got up and figured God wants me to go over to Macedonia. So he goes to Macedonia, catches the next ship. Yeah, it's very simple. Like, let's not overcomplicate this stuff, okay? God says, go. Okay, let's go. Right? So he goes west. Now, he, you, you know the story. This is Paul's second missionary journey. 
and you know, he crosses the Aegean Sea and gets over there, and he starts working his way down through Macedonia, and when he's there, he's being chased by angry mobs. You know, to the point that some of these places, he's only spending days with the, with, the, with the people that are getting converted. And I think in Thessalonica, he says, I was only with you for three Sabbaths. So two to three weeks max. And in that amount of, now pastors, raise your hand if you're a pastor. Oh, I've got a whole bunch of mess of pastors. There's a pack of pastors up here. Okay. All right. So in your discipleship programs, how long, if you have a new convert, how long do you usually wait before you start, start talking about the resurrection of the dead and the man of lawlessness? <laughs> Took Paul two weeks. <laughs> Within three Sabbaths time frame, you know, if you read the two letters to, to that church in th- uh, the Thessalonians... Like within two Sabbaths, he's, or three Sabbaths, he's talking to them about the end of the age and God's meta narrative that includes the resurrection of the dead. It's pretty incredible stuff. But angry, mo- this is the part of the story where it says, Those who turn the world upside down have come here. Right? This, this is that part of the story. Paul's working his way down through Macedonia and he's being chased by angry mobs. He's got Silas with him and Timothy, right? This is where Paul and Silas end up in jail, all that stuff. You know the story. Then he ends up down in Athens. And it's either from Athens or Corinth that he writes those letters to the Thessalonians. But ultimately, he gets to Corinth. And it says that he's worried because these angry mobs have been, uh, come on, Bethel! <laughs> Praise God. (laughs) So um, he gets to Corinth and he's still worried about these angry mobs. He's a man on the move. But guess what happens in Corinth? He gets another dream. He gets another dream and God says, don't leave Corinth. See, he's... Conventional thinking, right. practical wisdom, some street smart says, I can't stay here very long. And God has to intervene in that kind of thinking. Listen, sometimes <laughs> our own smarts will get us into trouble. It'll, it, it, it'll, it'll hold us back. And so God gives him a dream and says, don't leave Corinth. I'm going to deal with that stuff. Stay. And it says that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. It's incredible, like considering that he had been on the move for so much. And so I think this is interesting, and I'm tying this in with this pattern that we saw in Matthew 1 and 2, that God is supremely confident in entrusting the advancement of the gospel with, by giving people dreams if they will be obedient to those dreams. Very simple point, but I I really wanted to lay that down as a foundation before I go anywhere else tonight, because I I think that, uh, and and don't don't get all charismatic weird on me here when I say this, because I was about to say, God's about to give us an upgrade, and that's usually the part where everyone goes, woo! (laughs) No, but we need an upgrade. Can we come at it from that point of view? We need an upgrade. And, and uh, maybe I'll give a, a little bit of a, uh, a plug here because I'll be sharing more on Friday. And, and I do think that uh, I'm supposed to share some things with you that I believe that will give, us a, give you a different perspective about the, this 2024 and the days that we're going into right now that are going to be so inc- incredibly complex. We need a divine upgrade in our revelation so that we know how to navigate and so that we don't spin the wheels of trying to get back to the way business was before COVID. Most of our churches missed an opportunity to, to discern the times we were in and reinvent. We spent most of our energy trying to figure out how to get back to the way things were. And, and I don't know that, that that works. So anyway, we need an upgrade.
So I want to talk about dreams tonight, but, uh, but I am coming at it from a different angle. I'm not here to talk about dream dictionaries. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even here to talk about how to interpret your dreams. Okay. I'm not actually even here to talk about like how to get a, a personal dream that really encourages you. There's other things. You, you can go buy a, a dozen books on those topics. And, uh, you know, I'll say this about dream dictionaries. They're helpful, but it's not, it's, it, it's not science. This stuff is more like an art form than it is a science. You know, they're, they can be helpful, but uh, be careful getting locked in too much because remember, the God of the universe is speaking your language. See, this is incredible. What, what an incredible God we serve. If we, you get on a plane and fly to a foreign nation and get off and, 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 and they start talking to you in a foreign language, you understand it. If you want to communicate, you have to learn their language. And yet we serve a God that has chosen. Hey, he's made himself so vulnerable in this. I don't know how else to express it, but he's, he's, he's made himself vulnerable to the extent that he'll learn your language and then speak to you in that language because he wants you to understand it. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to search it out. Do you realize that, how many of you, right, show me your hands again, if you feel like, do we have any dreamers here? You feel like, I dream and I know it's prophetic, or at least I dream and I know it's God. It's a lot of, lot of hands right here. I think by the end, pastor, by the end of this conference, all of these hands are going to be up. Do you, listen, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. To, he creates, he, he likes to create mysteries, yeah. but it's the glory of kings to search it out. When God gives you prophetic dreams, I believe this is a divine endorsement. It is actually communicating and bestowing upon you your, your kingly calling and your kingly anointing. It's the glory of kings to search things out. So, I believe uh, rather than talking about dream dictionaries, what I want to do is, is go through some stories with you, and uh, I want to give you a, a little bit of taste. Uh, since most of you don't know me, um, we, we've been a, a, a part of a very hidden ministry in Washington, D.C. for almost 20 years, and, uh, and I thought maybe I would just share with you a little bit of our journey, and, and you'll... You'll understand a little bit about where I've come from, where we've been, but tucked into all of that, I believe it's going to encourage your heart, come on. It's particularly in this area of receiving dreams from the Lord that give you strategic direction for prayer. Because it's, 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 it's good to get a dream, it's better to do something with it. And, and I just have found in my own life that the more I value that, the more I, the more I esteem it and the, the higher of, uh, level that I prize that, that God would speak to me prophetically through dreams, the more he gives me. And not just me, but we've built an entire community around this concept that we said here in this community, we are going to value this. I read a book years ago called Windows of the Soul by Ken Geyer. It's a devotional book. Has anybody ever read that? He just talks about all the different ways that God can talk to you. It's not just the written word, but God can speak to you through a movie. You know, it's like, it, and the, the whole idea is that if you open these windows, you get some fresh air that comes in. You know, and, and one of the ways that he highlighted is through dreams. And we've just decided as a community in Washington, D.C., that we have flung open that window. It doesn't close anymore. <laughs> wow. we, we painted it open. <laughs> we threw open that window at the risk of getting a few flies. But, oh, it's been worth it for all the fresh air that blows in through that window. And, and it's not to say that dreams are better than, you know, visions or any, any other type of prophetic channel. Uh, it's just that for us, We've just experienced it at a level that this is where our faith is. Right. And, and I've just learned to trust it. Even, you know, it, it, mo a lot of our dreams, 
work like words of knowledge. Really, it feels more like a word of knowledge than, than yeah. anything else yeah. in its nature. In the, and what I mean by that is that you would go to sleep and you would get information about a situation that you have no natural knowledge of, only to wake up from the dream and to look into it and see, oh, wow, this is actually a thing. Boy, when something like that happens, that's kind of a freak out. You know, it's like, wow, I really do hear from God. <laughs> Surprise yourself, you know. It's kind of like if you're, you know, if you get a, a word of knowledge for somebody, you're like, you know, somebody's got something wrong with something and you call that out, you kind of just do it like, isn't that kind of weird? Like, in a sense, it's like, you know, you call it out because God wants to heal it. But then if nobody responds, if nobody's got that, you're disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than be happy that nobody's got that affliction. <laughs> It's kind of, kind of backwards, isn't it? It's kind of weird. Man, I really wanted somebody to have, like, kidney disease. You know, it's like, what is that? <laughs> it's kind of weird. Well, let me just jump in. I want, I want to kind of go through a story because I, I know time is short. Um, if you could put up, uh, if the media team could put up that first image, we'll do a little bit of show and tell tonight. I wanted to, to start here. This is actually the a picture of the end of the story. What you're looking at uh, has a time stamp on it. This is 1010 AM on June 24th, 2022. This is the moment that the decision was released from the Supreme Court, you see that in the background, that Roe v. Wade was no more. <laughs> this is that, I was there, that's my wife, Kim. We are just sobbing in each other's arms. This is my oldest daughter, Taylor, over here on, on the right side. Her husband, Trace. And that's my first grandson. That's Liam. And she's actually pregnant with my second grandson. So, yeah, I've got three grandsons under two and a half years old. Well, that's a good time right there. <laughs> I just spent Christmas with these boys. It's awesome. Um. So this, this is that moment, and, you know, it, it wasn't that I was just, I just happened to be passing by at this moment. We had been standing there for 18 years. We had been there for 18 years. Uh, I wasn't going to miss it. Like, when we got down to the very end, we knew it was coming down, and so every minute that they're, you know, we're looking at the schedule, any opportunity that we knew a decision could come out, we were there, and... But the, the reality, though, is that we had been there for 18 years. So I wasn't just walking by and I just happened to be there. And what's funny is it looks like we're there all alone, but we're not. We're actually surrounded by thousands of people screaming and yelling the most vile things at us. And you can see there's at least two rows of fencing. <laughs> it's not usually like that. Uh, they call that a non-scalable fence. That's a message for another day. <laughs> Let the reader understand. <laughs> but 18 years to get to this moment. And what I would like to do is, is just maybe kind of walk through those 18 years, if that's okay. I want, I, want to, I want to give you some examples of how the Lord spoke to us and gave us dreams that gave us strategic information about how to pray and how those prayers then set a course for the shifting of that court leading to this moment right here. Now, let me preface this by saying the pro-life movement in America is massive and a lot of people are involved and probably in this room, many of you have a lot of skin in the game and have, had have served the pro-life movement for years. I'm just speaking from my little experience, my little niche, which is to stand in front of that court. And I can say this because I stood there long enough, not very many people. And uh, I can say for, the, for most of the 18 years, we were there alone. It's not to say nobody else was praying, but I just know that we, we were given a, an assignment to stand there in front of the court. Now, as I share some of these stories, I think what will be evident is that there's principles and there's 
encouragement in these stories that I believe you'll be able not just to say, wow, that's really cool what God did with you guys. I think there's actually valuable information here that you'll be able to, to take with you that will encourage your heart and will equip you so that you can apply these same things to other situations that you're praying about. If you're praying for your family, maybe a family member who's, who's not serving the Lord, maybe how to pray for the city, how to pray for Washington State, how to pray for America. This is part of this upgrade, I think, that we desperately need and that God is more than willing to release is to direct us in how to contend for the destiny of this nation. Now, I was uh, preparing some notes for this this morning, and, and I was overcome with emotion. I got all of it out today, so I think I'm fine right now. Today, January 17th, is a very... Uh, meaningful anniversary for me. It was 20 years ago today that my dad unexpectedly passed away. 20 years ago today. Now, why is that important? That actually set in motion the events that I'm about to share with you. After uh, my dad passed away, um, uh, it really threw me for a, a, a tailspin. And, and, you know, some of you more mature folks in the room, you've, you've gone through that where you lose mom or dad. Some of you young people, you haven't, but you will at some point. And one of the things that, that really uh, became important to me during that year after my dad died was I wanted to figure out where my family had come from. But, but something else was going on. I, I kind of lost a taste for ministry. I was kind of going through this divine discontent time in my life where I had kind of withdrawn from ministry at my local church, things like that, and I was just searching because I felt like something was missing, something needed to change, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Well, that's a really good time to get a dream, and that's exactly what happened. So it was in September of 2004 that I had a dream, and I'm going to tell you this dream because it sets this, I think it, it sets in motion everything else I'm going to share. In the dream, I'm in a huge room that's filled with young people, and there's a chalkboard that fills one side of the room, a massive chalkboard. And on that chalkboard is written information, facts and figures about abortion, and it's covering this chalkboard from left to right, top to bottom, completely filled. And in the dream, all these young people stand up, and they're holding chalkboard erasers. Now, your first instinct is to think that they're going to go up and try to erase what's written, but they don't. In the dream, they stand up and they begin to pray. And every time they say a prayer, they would step up to that chalkboard and they would hit it. They would strike it with their eraser and it would make this cloud of white dust. And I don't understand what I'm seeing in the dream, but it's happening. All of them are happening at the same time. And it gets to the point where you can't hear any one person praying. It's now just one continuous rumble of prayer and the, the, the repeated hits of all of the, these prayers, the impact of their prayers is just this thunderous rumble that doesn't stop. And in the dream, I know that this is going all day and all night. Well, I don't, I don't understand what I'm seeing, but I look over and there's a man, a very conspicuous man in my dream. And in the dream, I knew his name was Lou Engle. How many of you know this guy named Lou Engle? I didn't. I didn't know there was, I didn't know Lou Engle. Guys, I, I didn't come from the prayer movement. I didn't come from the pro-life movement. I was a youth pastor in a little old church in Denver. I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't care about abortion. That's why this dream is so unusual. Is it, this didn't like bubble up from my own experiences. I didn't know anything about it, mostly because I didn't want to. Ouch. But in the dream, I see there's this man named Lou Engle, and I go and I talk to him, and I ask him this weird question. I say, how do you function the next day after you do this all night? <laughs> it's just kind of how I'm wired. Like, how's this going to work? And, and, and some of you guys know who Lou Engle is, and he looks at me, and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and he turns, and he hits the chalkboard even harder. If you know Lou, that's his voice. I didn't know. I didn't know. And so this is going on all night. And at one point, I look over out a window and I see the sun is coming up. It's a new day. 
And when I look back at the chalkboard, now the chalkboard, you can no longer read anything that had been written on it. It's now been made completely white. Wow. It's not erased. Now, let me interpret this for you a little bit. <laughs> what I've learned is that we murdered 64 million people. You can't erase that. That was real. But when the indictment against this nation is written, just like the, the court case of Isaiah 1, when God summons the nation and he says, you've got blood on your hands, he says this, now come, let us reason together. Though your sins be red like scarlet, they will be white like wool. Though they're red like crimson, they will be made like snow. And I remember, this is my dream. I saw that I saw an indictment against America being made white. So this dream marked me. I uh, didn't know what to do with it. I found out there's a real guy named Lou Engel. He's really doing this thing with prayer <laughs> through a friend of a friend of a friend of a youth pastor's friend. <laughs> I got a phone number of a guy that worked with the Lou Engel. And I called him. And I figured he probably needs a prophet in his life. <laughs> Jesus, I'm willing. So I called him. I said, hey, I don't know you and you don't know me, but I had a dream. And he goes, really? What was your dream? I did not expect to be taken that seriously. This was weird. Now, I, I became a Christian when I was 15. I got filled with the Holy Spirit when I was 18. I've been serving in like a non-denominational, non spirit-filled environment in the church for, you know, that whole time. But I was not a dreamer. That was not a part of the recipe. And so I didn't expect to be taken seriously. So I told him my dream, and he said, this is interesting. You've just dreamt exactly what God is sending us to do. We've got a team of young people, and we're going to Washington, D.C. to pray for the ending of abortion. Maybe you should come. God might have something for you there. He said, we're going to be holding a prayer meeting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial on Martin Luther King Day which in 2005 was January 17th. 19 years ago today, it was the one year, it was the one year anniversary that my dad had died and I showed up and the whole story changed that day. Now you gotta come back Friday because I've got other stories about that event, but I have to move on. This is, this is very meaningful to be here with you today. This was 19 years ago today. So go ahead and go to uh, the next image, if you would, please. Um, woo, with my name. <laughs> Maybe make the name disappear. That's, that's, is this okay, Pastor? I feel like I'm going long. I don't know. Okay. Okay. So this is just another picture from that same moment. That's my wife, Kim. You can see we're just a hot mess. And just weeping and giving, giving thanks to God for what he has done. And I remember praying right there. I said, God, any crown that, we've been, that we have in this moment right now, we gleefully throw it at your feet right now. We give you all the glory. Praise. We didn't end Roe v. Wade. He did. And like I said, you can't see the thousands that are around us because we're actually pushed right up against the fence. I'll tell you a funny story. Not funny. It's just weird and cool. Is, is our team gathered. There was about a dozen of us that, there that day, and we just gathered up and to receive communion. Every time we went to the court, we received communion. Every time. For 18 years, we received communion, and we applied the blood of Jesus to the doorposts of our national guilt to go and plead the blood. And so this day was no different. We circled up to receive communion. And as we were doing it, uh, these, these uh, protesters from the other side, they were raging in this moment because they, they just lost their crown jewel. They just lost the crown jewel that's fueling the demonization of our culture. And they began to circle us. And so as we were, have you ever taken communion like that? We're, we're giving thanks for the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. 
and they're circling around us, hurling the most vile words and insults that they can muster. And in that moment, I was so happy. <laughs> I was so, I was so happy. And, and the Lord reminded me, he's like, they did this to me too. Psalm 22. You, you guys understand that when he's hanging on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The church has mistakenly interpreted that to mean, oh, God, the father turned his back on his son. He couldn't look at him. That's not what that's talking about. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's saying to those that, are, that can hear him, that's me. I'm the one that was written about where he says the strong bulls of Bashan have come down and encircled me. The wild dogs have come down and encircled me. This, get this in your mind and in your hearts. Jesus is hanging on the cross, offering the body and the blood, and hell empties, and they all come down to, to gloat over this, thinking that they have won. They had no idea that they were actually being summoned for their own judgment. So I was happy. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Well, some of you uh, are maybe unfamiliar with uh, what we did. So I, I just wanted to show you so you can get a visual in your head if you could go to the next image. This is what we did for 18 years. God gave us a dream where the, uh, we saw thousands of people filling the streets of D.C., and in the dream, we zoomed down. We're seeing it from overhead. We zoomed down in the dream to the Supreme Court, and we turn and look, and all of the people have a piece of duct tape over their mouth with the word life handwritten on it. Well, what do you do with that? Right. It's kind of weird, kind of mysterious. But then God revealed, just do the dream. This is what we've said for all these years. Just do the dream. Don't overthink this. If God tells you to do something, do your best just to... By the grace of God, just do the dream. So we did the dream. You can go ahead and go to the next image. This is what it looks like to do the dream. I'm telling you, we, to, to, to do it in the heat, to do it in the freezing, to do it in the crowds, to do it all alone, go ahead and go to the next image. Sometimes you're in a crowd like this. Most of the time, we're just out there all alone doing the dream. Daring to believe that God is supremely confident in releasing strategies to people who are willing to just do the dream. Yeah. It, aren't you glad that Joseph just did the dream when he says, get up and go to Egypt? He did the dream. He went to Egypt. So this is what we did for 18 years. And I think it's important for us to understand that our dreams are invitations for prayer. Your dreams are invitations into intercession. Your dreams are actually invitations into your destinies. We say it this way. We say, I had a dream, but the dream had me. God will give you a dream that will hold you in place when all hell breaks loose, when everything goes the wrong way, when all of your friends leave and betray you, when everything goes the opposite direction that you know it should, God will release a dream. He'll put a dream in your heart that will, it, it, it'll just hold you. It'll sustain you. For 18 years, my own dream, and there's been so many, but my own dream, when it got hard, I could go back and say, God, you showed me the end of abortion. I saw it. I saw the end from the beginning. I know this is your heart. I know this is what you have. Hallelujah. And what a privilege it is to give your life for that. There was another dream that came at the beginning of our house of prayer. And uh, I'll tell you this one too. This one's kind of a big one for us. It helped us understand because within the pro-life movement, and Pastor Angela, you know, just even like for NDP, you, you know how this works. Like, a, a lot of the church just, just kind of like simplify it, give it to me like 
make it as easy as possible. And so usually, for the most part in the pro-life movement, it's, you know, thou shalt not murder, right? That ought to be enough. But, and it is enough. But for us, God began to reveal to us his heart that what was really going on here had to do with the shedding of innocent blood and, and how that was demonizing the nation. Well, that's not a very popular message. But he gave it, really, the interpretation that came primarily through a dream that he, that he gave us at the very beginning. The dream was we were in a huge building filled with courtrooms, and we were being led from one courtroom to another. And the Lord spoke through this dream, and he said, either you deal with Roe v. Wade in your courts, or I will deal with it in mine. Well, that's a very serious statement. And at the end of a long hall, there was a huge courtroom, and on the door... It read Appomattox Courthouse. Does anybody know what Appomattox Courthouse is? Oh, see, this is interesting. American History 101. <laughs> 1861 to 1865, we fought a civil war. A lot of opinions about what that was about. By the end, everybody knew what it was about. It was about the shedding of the innocent blood of the African and this nation's failure to stop that shedding of innocent blood. And what God did was he dealt with this nation with a great discipline. I can take you in the Lincoln Memorial that I showed you earlier, and etched on the northern wall are the words from Lincoln's second inaugural address where he said, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that the scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, that's the American economy, and if every drop of blood drawn by the last shall be repaid with a drop of blood drawn by the sword, as it was said 3,000 years ago, so it must be said again that the judgments of the Lord are righteous and true altogether. That's the President of the United States. Did you catch all of that? Basically, by, by the end, everybody knew that God's hand of discipline was on this nation because of the shedding of innocent blood. Appomattox Courthouse is the place where General Lee surrendered to Grant. Appomattox marks the end of the Civil War. And the new estimates in recent years put the death toll at 750,000 lives lost in that war. So, what, God, why are you taking historical language from a previous time of conflict in this nation and dropping it in for this generation to pray? What is that all about? Listen, I hope you understand this prayer, that we understood the severity of this moment, the seriousness of it, and we began to pray, God, we don't want to have to go back to Appomattox. Do you understand that prayer? This was serious stuff. So for 18 years... That was the heartbeat of what we were praying. We knew that we had to shift that court. We had to shift those seats on the court, and we had to overturn Rome. And God initiated all of that through prayers, or through dreams, I'm sorry. It was the dreams that set us on that track. Well, how many of you know who Reese Howells is? Reese Howells, he was a, uh, there's a book called Reese Howells Intercessor. He's a man who uh, was used man of prayer that was used by God in a mighty way, especially during World War II, where they were getting revelation about how to pray. And from their prayer room in Wales, the Bible College of Wales, they were praying over battlefields and dictating how the war would go from that place. Well, that's a huge inspiration to us. Reese, the way he taught intercession was that there's three elements of intercession. And it goes in this order. Identification, agony, authority. In that order. See, now, I say that, I emphasize that because a lot of us, when we pray, we just want to go straight to the authority. Okay. The authority of the believer, right? The finished work of the cross, we want to go boom. But I, I'm just, I want to just tell you from experience, there's more to it. This is, this is not 101, this is 301, okay? And so the way Reese taught on intercession is that there are three stages that you will go through when you're truly interceding for something. The first stage is identification. The second stage is agony. The third stage is authority. Now, 
This blessed me when I learned this because now suddenly the dream made sense of the life tape. You know, we're just doing the dream. We're trying to be obedient. But what we learned in the experience is we understand this was our identification, that we would voluntarily give up our voice to identify with the silence of the baby in the womb. Do you see that? Yeah. Is, is there, there's so many things that God accomplished through that life tape, but this was the big one for us, is that we were voluntarily giving up our voice and only had, only had one word on our lips, and it was God's word that said life. So we went through years of this identification, but then here's what happened, guys. For 18 years, for the most part, we lost. There was some little victories here and there, maybe even some medium-sized victories, but for the most part, nothing, well, I can say this, nothing ever challenged Roe v. Wade. And for the most part, all of those years, we went from loss to loss to loss. That was hard. And let's just be really honest, for, for the prayer movement, for people of prayer, when it gets hard and when things aren't going your way, the challenge is to not quit. That's a big challenge. And we over-spiritualize it. We say, well, you know, God's moving me into a different season. <sighs> I, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving. I can say what, I'm like Pastor Troy. I can just <laughs> say whatever I want. No, we do this. We over-spiritualize it, and, or it's not even over-spiritualized. It's pseudo-spiritualized, and we, we've, we've invent excuses to quit doing the hard thing. Meanwhile, we're standing there and every time we went, God's giving us his heart. We know, he's there. He's there. Oh, now think about this. Oh. Jesus goes in the garden. He can only invite three of those 12 boys. And he's about to go into his moment of darkest agony the night before his betrayal the night of his betrayal and the moments before the events that would lead him to being hung on the cross and he invites these three boys to go with him and he says now wait here and and keep watch and I don't think he like disappeared I think he was with insight and within earshot the invitation was for those boys to be close enough to eavesdrop on what the father was say or what the son was saying to the father. Wow. And what did they do? Checked out, went to sleep. Three times he comes back. Are you kidding me? Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And Damon Thompson, I heard him preach it this way one time. He said, he said, Can you imagine having been invited to the garden? And the opportunity was in his darkest moment of, of agony to be the one to minister to him in his agony over what was about to happen, to, to be there and to minister to him. Oh, that was the invitation. That was the invitation. And this was our invitation to, to come to the court every time we came to the court. To minister to the Lord, who's heartbroken over every dream that was shattered in the womb. So we understood that this was our identification, but let me take you into the agony of losing a little bit. You know, I, I wrote a title for this message at the beginning, and it just says dreams. Or, learning how to lose. That's what it says here. Learning how to lose. Who wants to learn how to be a loser? <laughs> it's funny, but I am dead serious. When this was all done after June 24th, 2022, my team and I, we sat down and we spent a couple of weeks just trying to process what just happened. What's the big takeaway? What did we learn? And we boiled it down. We distilled it down. Out of 18 years, we learned, you have to learn how to lose. That was our big takeaway. And I'll give you an example. In 2016, well, I should say 2014, a decade ago, a court case came out of Texas. 
Now, every time we went and stood at the court, we're praying to shift the court. God gave us the assignment to shift the nine justices, to shift the court, and we would say, now, God, raise a case up out of the states that will come and crash into Roe v. Wade. 2014, a case came out of Texas. It did not challenge Roe, but it was one of these that had, like, restrictions, like hospital admitting privileges, things like that, you, if you're familiar with that. For two years, we fasted and prayed. And, and here's the thing. We didn't pick and choose. Oh, don't hedge your bets. Beloved, don't hedge your bets when it comes to the assignments of God. Don't, don't keep... You know what I'm saying? When God gives you an assignment... Don't hold back so that you got a little extra in case it doesn't work out. And so 2014, we went all in for two years. We fasted and prayed, and we felt like we've, we've got this. We felt like we were going to win. And we just we were standing in such confidence. There were dreams and prophetic words and visions, all of it. We're like, we had confidence. Guys, I think we've got this. God's got this. We're going to win. And then on June 28th, 2016, if you could put up the next image, please. This happened. Now, this is the cover of USA Today, June 28th, 2016. We lost. Now, this was painful because we had contended for a lot of things like this, but this was a big one. I mean, some of you might even remember this. That was a long time ago now. The purple people up there, uh, that's the pro-abortion people. They're, they're cheering. But then underneath them, <laughs> do you see this photo? There's a couple of people you can see putting red life tape. That's my team. That's, that's us. Now, it's really small. You can't see it. But if you see the third person, the one that's over there with his head hanging down, that's me. <laughs> June 28, 2016, we became national Po the national poster child for losers. Now, it's hard, not because I had some reputation to protect. No, I was just thinking, God, what about all the prayers? What about all the fastings? What about all the dreams that you gave us? And we entered, we were entering more into an agony than I had ever known. Now, let me show you the next image of another newspaper from this same event. If you could switch to the next image. Make the name disappear there. Help. Just, I'll wait so you can read it. Pro-choice victory. Pro-life agony with a big, fat picture of us. In this moment, what we were experiencing was the, 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 just the disappointment of defeat. But when I saw this, I got happy. Now, it's painful, but when I saw this, this was for me. God, God made a, a, an editor write that headline so that I knew where I was in the story. That we've gone through our identification and now we have entered into this level of agony. What's next? I know we're now, oh, I got happy. Because now I know, now I know I got a breakthrough coming. Now I know I'm heading towards authority. But it's only 2016. <laughs> Guys, I said, you, you already know the end of the story. I still had years to go. Oh, but God was so good. He was so good to speak to us in this. I knew exactly what was coming. I have so many stories to tell. Man. I have to tell these. I want you guys, I, let me take you into the, the end game of this thing. We were, do you have to understand, for 18 years, we were dreaming on a weekly basis. God was giving us manna for the day of how to pray and to carry his heart and minister to him throughout this time. But we get into the end, 
And lo and behold, a case came out of Mississippi, Dobbs v. Jackson. If you guys know, this is, this is the case. This is the one. This is what's coming. But we didn't know then. This case came up out of Mississippi. This is it 2021, over the summer, and uh, I was in a meeting with Cindy Jacobs. Who, how many of you know who Cindy Jacobs is? Scary lady. <laughs> She's a spiritual mom to me. I love her. But we were talking, and she said, what's going on? What's the latest with the Dobbs case? And I said, well, the court's going to hear it. The state's legal brief is due at the court on July 22nd. Or I'm, yeah, July 22nd. And she said, July 22nd, 722. It's Daniel 722. You, she prophesies, you need to begin to pray and prophesy Daniel 722 over the Dobbs case. What does 722 say? Oh, that's when the saints are losing. They're losing and they're losing. And then all of a sudden, it shifts in verse 22. And it says, and the ancient of days was seated. And a verdict was rendered in favor of the saints. And the saints possess the kingdom. 722 is where the shift takes place and God renders the verdict. So we began to pray and prophesy Daniel 722 over this. And I remember I was in the prayer room one day and we're praying. And this prayer came out of me. I, I said, see, I'm in the weeds here a little bit. But see, Mississippi was arguing. See, they had passed a 15-week abortion ban, and they were arguing that that was allowed under statute, the current statute. So their legal strategy for two years was to argue that that was allowed. And I was in the prayer room one day, and I was led to pray, God, change the legal strategy of the state and, and take down Roe itself. And after I prayed it, I was like, that was weird. Wow. Why did I pray that? July 22nd, the state's brief shows up. They punted their old legal strategy from the previous two years, and they said in their brief, they said, Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong and deserves to be overturned. They went after the whole thing. They went after the crown jewel. Oh, this was huge. This was huge. And we began to pray and carry it through the, all the way to the finish line. We had a dream. I just want you to see this because the reason I'm connecting this to the whole aspect of government and kingly authority is I believe that, that God will release to you dreams for intercession that will actually shift the destinies of nations. Well, this one was kind of obvious. But we had a dream... My wife had a dream one time, it's like back in 2016, where she saw the nine seats of the court. Is this okay? You guys all right? You with me? All right. She saw in the dream the nine seats, and there's a man standing behind one of the seats, and she knows in the dream his name is Byron White. Oh, this is so good. When you get names in dreams and you don't know who those people are, guys, we, we, we got the names of Supreme Court nominees sometimes years before they were ever on the scene. We prayed for Amy Coney Barrett by name for three and a half years because we got her name in a dream. I'm telling you, you got to do something with it. So she has a dream. She sees this man. She says she knew his name was Byron White. She doesn't know who Byron White is. And he looks at her and he says, take back my seat. Well, she wakes up and she looks. Byron White used to be a Supreme Court justice. And the seat that he sat on by seniority was the seat she saw him standing behind in the dream, the actual seat. But when he retired from the court, his replacement was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So in the dream, he says, take back my seat. Well, now fast forward. September 18th, 2020, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. All these years, when we, we prayed in, in our time there, we prayed through 10 nominations to the Supreme Court and eight confirmations. We had to hold back one Republican nominee and one Democrat nominee. This is not political. 
This is not about Republican or Democrat. God gave us dreams and told us what to do. So that's why I say we prayed through 10 nominations and eight confirmations, confirmations of names we had received in dreams. Boy, that, that'll mess with your politics, actually, won't it? You say, well, I didn't vote for that person, and I, I don't like what they did, and blah, 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 blah. I'll, I'll just say it this way. I know God's answering my prayers. I don't know about yours. <laughs> Hear me now. Stone me later. <laughs> All I know is we were getting names in dreams. And I was daring to do something with those dreams. And suddenly, governmental seats of authority are shifting. But it had always been one for one. The, the balance of the court had never shifted until September 18th, 2020, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, Byron White's seat. And in the dream, he said, take back my seat. And I don't know if you guys remember this, but 2020 was an election year. And it was very contentious. But you know what happened right before the election? Amy Coney Parrott was run through and put in that seat. For the first time, the, 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 the balance, the weight of the court shifted by one seat. And it shifted to an, a direction that we believe now set the stage for the end of Roe v. Wade. So now... Right at the end, of, it's in 20, the beginning of 2022, one of my team has a dream where we're standing in front of the Supreme Court like we always do, but then we, we depart and we walk over a block and there's another court, and it's the court superior. And it these, has these huge steps that go up and it's bigger than the Supreme Court. And in the dream, uh, uh, my... so. This is no small detail. The guy that had the dream, his name's Daniel. And he had this dream while we were on a 21-day fast. <laughs> Take note. <laughs> this is kind of a big deal. It's Daniel 10. So Daniel has a dream, these huge steps, and we, we climb up these huge steps. And in the dream, he says, there really is a superior court. And we turn and we look, and there's a, a white paper comes flying out the front door of the Supreme Court and it comes over to where we are and it starts coming up the steps to the court superior. And in the dream, it comes through us. Like it literally passes through where we're standing in the dream. And it goes into the superior court. What the heck does that mean? Well, we started digging into it. It's like, well, I understand the superior court, the court that's above the Supreme Court, all that stuff. What's the white paper? And we were... We were digging into this, and it suddenly dawned on us. What about that guy, Byron White? Do you know who Byron White was? He wrote the dissent in, in Roe v. Wade. He wrote the dissent in 1973 of Roe v. Wade. And so we said, we got to get out White's paper. So we get out his dissent, and the Lord led us to pull apart his opinion that he wrote in 1973. And uh, I've got an attorney on my board of directors. Those are really good to have. And, <laughs> and I said, help us. He's a constitutional attorney. Help us. And so we pulled apart his dissent and we wrote prophetic decrees based on what he said ought to be the law of the land. From his dissent, we rewrote them as prophetic decrees, and those things became Jeremiah 23 hammers in the prayer room. Oh, the hammer that breaks the rocks to pieces. Is not my word like a hammer. So we began to hammer away with these prophetic decrees. All I can say is this. When the Roe v. Wade opinion came out, we read through it. All of those statements that we wrote in the prayer room are in black and white. They are in the opinion that overturned Roe. All of them. God was giving us prayers. Now, let me tell you how specific this is. God was giving us prayers to pray. God, break off substantive due process from the 14th Amendment. What? 
No, he was, I'm, guys, I'm telling you, this is how specific he was getting. Oh, we were, we're, we're in the end game here. He's being that specific. Break substantive due process off of the 14th Amendment. And we were making these prophetic decrees. All of those are in the final opinion that overturned Roe. And let me end with this. If you could go to the last image. Don't read it. Look at me. Nobody read it. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. me. Don't read it yet. Samuel Alito wrote the opinion, and the judges all joined his opinion, the majority opinion. But Clarence Thomas, the only, at the time, the only African American on the court, and the only seat that we didn't replace. We prayed through eight of the nine. He's the only one that was there from the time when we first got there. One of the things that happened was we had... God gave us this message about Appomattox Courthouse. And he was drawing a a parallel for us to pray that was very difficult. We had to bear a lot of reproach for this because we were saying just like how, how God cared about the shedding of the innocent blood of the African, he feels about the shedding of the innocent blood of the baby in the womb. And we had to bear a lot of reproach where people felt like we, we were conflating that or that we, what we were saying was borrowed interest, that we were taking something away from that. But we, we knew we had to stand on that because it was the dream. So when the opinion came out, Clarence Thomas wrote a concurring opinion. And I pulled this excerpt from it. I want to read it to you. He says, third, substantive due process is often wielded to disastrous ends. For instance, in Dred Scott, Dred Scott's the case that said slaves have no rights in the courtroom. In Dred Scott v. Sanford, the court invoked a species of substantive due process to announce that Congress was powerless to emancipate slaves brought into the federal territories. While Dred Scott was overruled, quote, was overruled on the battlefields of the Civil War and by constitutional amendment after Appomattox. That overruling, that overruling was purchased at the price of immeasurable human suffering. And he goes on to say there at the bottom, after more than 63 million abortions have been performed, the harm caused by this court's forays into substantive due process remains immeasurable. You have to understand the vindication of God. That we felt that after 18 years of praying that Appomattox dream, it's actually in the opinion that overturned Roe. That blows my mind. It's in black and white. And we've always said this, pray your dreams and then go get a newspaper and read the headlines because many times, like the way God leads you to pray, you'll see answers to your prayers in the headlines. I believe this is what God is doing right now is that what is, he's releasing divine revelation for the prayer room. He's releasing it in dreams and he's actually writing history. I just want to give you faith. I want to give you faith. I want to encourage faith that your dream life isn't just for you to get a bless me while you sleep. God does that too. God God, God will encourage you. He'll give you what you need. He's a good daddy. He's got really good gifts. He's not going to deprive you. But what what if there's more? What if there's more that what if you could go to sleep and while your body's resting, your spirit man could stand at attention and begin and receive revelation? Daniel 2. Oh, my gosh. I'll talk more about this on Friday. Daniel 2. People are about to die and the prophets don't know it. Ouch. Nebuchadnezzar says, kill them all. And they show up to kill Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah. And they don't know that. And so they're like, what's going on? He tells me, he's like, give us a day. Actually, give us a night. So he goes to sleep and he gets a dream about Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he has this amazing prayer in Daniel 2 where he says, I give you thanks. You know, you're the one that raises up kings and tears them down. Light dwells with you, all that stuff. But it's the last part that's been sticking out to me. And I'll talk more about it on Friday. But he says, can we just turn to it together? I think this is the key right here. 
Daniel chapter 2. Then I'm going to land this. Verse 23. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise. For you have given me wisdom and might. Circle me. And you have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. Part of this upgrade that is needed is not just for you to get dreams, but for you to have a dream team. You need a dream team. You need an ecclesia of two or three. Daniel's got an ecclesia right here. He's got his three. And in a moment when there's about to be a calamity, they make a request. And look at, look at the answer, the praise that he gives. He says, you've given to me what we asked. What did they ask? Speak to us about the king's matters. Stand with me. I believe that God really does have an upgrade that he's bringing us into in 2024. And I just wonder, can we be a people that will stop thinking about ourselves all the time and say, why don't you talk to us about the matters of kings? Father, will you speak to us about the king's matter? daring to believe that he will and I'm daring to believe that he'll actually give us dreams that take us into the king's chamber take us into his bedroom reveal to us what's coming give us insight and information to strategically pray to see his will done on the earth as it is in heaven amen Amen. all right so I had, uh, what, what I kind of have in my heart right now is I, I, I just want a time of activation. If, if, if any of this has been an encouragement to you tonight, I just, it's, a, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I could have told you dozens and dozens and dozens of dreams where God gave us strategic information in advance so that we could carry it in the prayer room. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll go more into this on Friday, but it won't be so much about Roe v. Wade, it's going to be about the matters of kings. So I want to, I want to pray for you. And I, I, I think we have a ministry team. If, if, you, if this is stirring your heart, I, w- I actually want to invite you to respond. And not just, guys, don't, don't just lay back on this one. I, th- I think there, there has to be some kind of a response that says, I, I, want, I want this. Well, I'm not, this isn't magic. I'm just going to ask, you want dreams? I'm going to ask God to give you dreams. But here's the thing. Lou and I, Lou Engel and I talk about this all the time. Everywhere we go and talk about dreams, there's a dream explosion that takes place. There's something about just the activity of talking about it and sharing the testimonies and the stories that seems to just activate faith in our hearts. This is God, I want that. And the next thing you know, everybody starts having dreams. It's the most amazing thing. So let's throw open a window tonight, amen? You want to throw open a window? Come up here. I want to pray for you. And don't wait for me. Just just raise your hands. Just begin to lift your voice right now. He needs to hear your voice right now. God, God, tear open that dream dimension. Now, right now, I just pray, God, every pillow consecrated in the name of Jesus. Every pillow consecrated. Make every bedroom a place of encounter. Job 33 says, surely God speaks in one way or another, though man does not perceive it. Yet in a dream, in a vision of the night, he warns us. God, I pray right now, God, release the visions of the night. Visions in the night. God, something that's beyond our own thinking. Get us out of our own heads and our own thoughts. Come and visit us in the night. 
visit us in our sleep. Deliver angelic information to us. Oh. God, right now, I just, I just, I lead a prayer of repentance for anybody that this resonates with. God, any time I've ever discounted it or, or said it's just a dream and I just tossed it aside and forgot it by 10 o'clock. God, I repent right now. I repent for not valuing your word when it comes. I repent for not receiving what angels fought through to bring it to me. God, we ask for a fresh start. Let this be at the Refresh Conference. God, we ask for a fresh start on dreams in the name of Jesus. Any, any time where we've failed to value this, God, we ask for a fresh start tonight in the name of Jesus. I feel like there's there's some here that this whole the whole night there's been an element of fear because you suffer from nightmares and it feels like it's totally out of your control there's an oppression that 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 you're experiencing nightmares so this this dream is a ter- or this message is is a concerning and terrifying message for you listen your your sleep is unto the Lord. Mm. Let me just wait here for a second. Father, right now I just break fear off of our dream life. Some, in some cases, let me just say it, in some cases, you, you've opened the gate for unholy things and for perversion. And that will affect your sleep. That will affect your dream life. And you know if that's you, you know you need to, re- you need to, to repent of some things right now. And there's a closing of those doors. And that's going to release you into this dream dimension that I'm talking about. But you need to close those doors. You cannot allow some of that that uh, profanity in. But in, there's also some other cases where there is legitimate oppression that is not your own doing. And so right now, Father, ha, come on, be a big daddy right now. God, I'm asking for you to come and flex a little bit right now. Break oppression off of your people. God, where there's been cursing, where there's been word curses spoken, even where there's been iniquity in the family, God, where things have, like, generationally have flown down. God, right now, God, I'm asking, break that off in the name of Jesus. I'm asking that you would set your people at liberty right now in the name of Jesus. God, break fear off of your people. Break fear off of us. In the name of Jesus. I know, I think a ministry team has, has come forward. Is that true? You're all kind of in here together. Listen, if, if those two things that I just called out, if, if you're experiencing nightmares, and you know whether it's, your, it's something that, that you're involved in or if it's something you feel like is outside of you, I want to encourage you, turn around and whoever is on the ministry team, raise your hand. Let, let's do some business right now. If you need something specifically spoken to and ministered to, I, just, I don't want to miss this moment. God is all about making moments right now. Your your future could turn on this moment and the future of this nation could turn on this moment tonight in the name of Jesus. So I I need all the prayer ministry team 
to go ahead and go to those that have their hands raised. So if, go to them right now, prayer ministry team. Go ahead, fight through the crowd, fight through the crowd and get to those that raise their hand. If you want prayer, raise your hand. If you want prayer, raise your hand. We got a team of people that will come to you. Also, Bethel Ministry, you want to, if you if you want to go and pray for those that have their hands raised, you can do that too. You can receive prayer, or you can go and minister. Let the light open up the windows. Let the light open up the windows. Let the light, let the light in now. Open up the windows. Let the light 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 open up the windows. Let the light, let the light yeah. open up the windows. Let the light open up the windows. Let the light open up the windows. Let the light.
relight the fire on the altar, bring back the fragrance for your name. Give me the fear of God, fill me with wonder. Revive the heart, make me desperate, restore the fragrance of my worship. Cleanse my eyes, oh God, I need to see face to face. Above all others, Jesus, our Lord, holy, holy, you are holy, worthy, the most worthy, exalted above all. On the altar, bring back the reverence. Oh, your name, I give me the fear of God. Fill me with wonder. Relive the hunger. Make me desperate, restore the faith of our worship. Cleanse my eyes, oh Lord, I need to see you face to face. Holy, you are. Above all others, Jesus our Lord, holy, you are holy, worthy, the most worthy, exalted. On your turn 
flame of love with the flame of love oh, with the flame of love holy holy you are
in the flame of love.
your appeal I want to hasten your return The spirit and the bride say come for your beloved one I love the day of your appeal I want to hasten your return The spirit and the bride say come for your beloved one Oh, I love the day of your appearing. I want to hasten your return. The spirit and the rise, it come for your beloved one. Oh, oh yeah. the land will be the light. The land will be the light. The land will be the light The land will be the light Oh, I love the day of your appearing I want to hasten your return The spirit and the bicycle come for your beloved one I love the day of your own I want to hasten your return Spirit in the price and come For your beloved one yeah. We're gonna dance on streets of gold yeah. We're gonna sing forever holy yeah. The Lamb will be the light The Lamb will be the light Come on The Lamb will be the light The Lamb will be the light Desire of nation Rule and reign with us Desire nations who let me with the world. Desire nations who let me with the We're gonna dance on streets of gold. We're gonna sing forever holy. Yeah. Yes, we're gonna dance on streets of gold. We're gonna sing forever holy, 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 holy. The Lamb will be the light. The Lamb will be the light The Lamb will be the light The Lamb will be the light Yes, we're gonna take some streets of gold We're gonna see forever we will weep no more, 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 behold the lion and hear him roar, weep no more. Weep no more, behold the light. The Lamb will be the light. The Lamb will be the light. The Lamb 
will be the light The light will be the light Cause we're gonna dance on streets of gold We're gonna sing forever holy And do Jerusalem Yes, we're gonna dance on streets of gold We're gonna sing forever holy yeah. And do Jerusalem No Jerusalem No Jerusalem No Jerusalem Turn into your first song. 